Welcome to Better Health Guy Blogcasts, empowering your better health. And now, here's Scott, your Better Health Guy. The content of this show is for informational purposes only and is not intended to diagnose, treat, or cure any illness or medical condition. Nothing in today's discussion is meant to serve as medical advice or as information to facilitate self-treatment. As always, please discuss any potential health-related decisions with your own personal medical authority. Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode number 77 of the Better Health Guy blogcast series. Today's guest is Gary Blyer, and the topic of the show is advanced cell training. Gary Blyer struggled for years with his own chronic illness, ankylosing spondylitis. His search for answers took him from the realm of conventional medicine to exploring things he would have never previously imagined. Ultimately, Gary created ACT, or Advanced Cell Training, which trains the body to heal itself on all levels, physical, mental, and emotional. ACT teaches its users how to tap into our body's innate healing ability by identifying misbehaviors that bring about ill health. It works to reset the body's biological response to pathogens, mold, allergens, toxins, stress, and trauma. Gary freed himself from his own crippling illness, which had him nearly confined to a wheelchair. He has continued to develop ACT since its inception almost 20 years ago. During that time, Gary has worked with thousands of people to free themselves from pain, anxiety, and chronic illness and find peace within their own body. And now my interview with Gary Blyer. I love the idea of incorporating frequency and light and sound and similar techniques into a treatment program for chronic complex illnesses. I'm excited today to learn about advanced cell training or ACT from Gary Blyer, the creator of that system. So thanks for being here today, Gary. Thank you for having me, Scott. So as I recall, you had your own difficult health journey with ankylosing spondylitis. So tell us a little about that condition, some of the things that you experienced and explored, and how did that journey then lead you to create advanced cell training? Okay. Um, Ankylosing spondylitis, it's easy for me to say. Ankylosing spondylitis, as you know, is a uh, debilitating joint disease. In its later stages, it just stops your life, much like Lyme does. And um, I only believed in traditional medicine for 25 years. And although they helped, I continued to get worse and worse and worse and worse until finally uh, someone, a doctor, offered me surgery. And I realized at that point that I had better look at alternative things because surgery was not acceptable to me at all. I had a family to support and all of that. So I was kind of forced to look into alternative medicine. I really had no choice of surgery being totally unacceptable. So uh, I went to Mexico and California. I found some really great alternative people there. Uh, Some were doctors who were actually kicked out of the United States because they were a little too advanced. And uh, they brought me 70% of the way. and I was able to work again. I had already sold my business. I was a part owner of 1-800-DENTIST at the time. And because of my health, I had to sell that business that I loved. Um, I with nothing to do and 70% of my health back. I took what I learned from these different practitioners and I said, maybe I can do some of this at home. And um, so out of that, and essentially what really created advanced cell training and its process was that I became, it turns out I'm sort of a gifted muscle tester. You know, we were talking earlier that I sing at coffee shops <laughs> yeah. and, uh, you know, help people heal in the daytime and, you know, punish them in mass at night kind of thing. I don't have the gift of singing, but I seem to have a gift of a very, very accurate muscle test. And uh, with the training that I got, I kept asking the body once I understood that it had this intelligence what do you need to get well? And, you know, I didn't have any kind of a degree of any kind. So the, but what I was getting didn't require, what what came out of this was a behavioral modification program for the uh, body to heal itself, designed by the body itself through accessing its intelligence through the muscle test. And the net of that is, 
that I've learned the body is able on its own to kill pathogen. Uh, it turns out my ankylosing spondylitis, the degeneration of all my joints, my nervous system, my ability to think was rooted in pathogen. Uh, and although those folks helped me, I found myself in a continual health maintenance program. I had to keep going back to Mexico because I was sliding backwards no matter what I did. Once I trained my body how to, through the muscle test in this process, uh, to recognize and kill the pathogen that were attacking my brain, my nerves, my joints, I no longer am involved in any kind of health maintenance program because my body did what the doctors, those great doctors, were, they were trying to kill those bugs, but could not. My body did the job. And so my joints have regenerated. I am able to work. I can sleep. I can think. Um, but that's how I got here. I never had any intention to be involved in alternative medicine. I would have nothing to do with it, in fact, for 25 years. And through my journey and my own restoration of health, um, with, the, with the company sold, I said, well, maybe this will help other people, too. And sure enough, uh, I've been here now 20 years, and the track record is, is uh, it amazes me, actually. So. I, I think that's such an amazing story. I also am a huge fan of muscle testing. I don't know how I would have gotten to the place with my own health today if it hadn't been for muscle testing. So I know that is a controversial topic for some people that haven't yet experienced the benefits, but I'm, I'm definitely a huge fan of that. So how did your work with advanced cell training end up focusing then so much on Lyme disease? And was it more that Lyme was a common condition for which very few solutions existed? And why is it through all this work that you've done, why is it that you think Lyme has become such a big problem today? Such a big problem to today, today for people. Yep. yep. Um, originally, when I opened up the clinic, I thought it was going to be an allergy clinic. Again, it's correcting the body's behaviors. At that time, I did not know the body could kill pathogen, but because I had lost my 40 year allergies, I knew the body could stop overreacting to harmless allergens. So my first company was called Allergy Alternatives. And I called 40 friends who had allergies and mine are gone. Um, why don't you come down? We'll see if this thing works. And to my surprise, it did. And they signed notarized testimonials. So there was nothing on the radar about Lyme disease at that time. Uh, because of the success word of mouth locally here in Rhode Island kind of took over and more and more people were coming. And as they came, not only did they have allergies, but they had other conditions too. And um, what happened was somebody walked in with, with Lyme. And I started to figure out uh, about that time that not only could the body stop overreacting to harmless substances for allergies, but I started to see people, when we focused on the pathogen uh, that were causing their symptoms, I saw the body's corrective behavior through this training process reduce their symptoms uh, for Lyme disease. And what happened was they started talking to people. Who, you know, the Lyme community is a real community. When you've gotten Lyme, you have been hit by a truck. And... It's a topic of conversation, I think. And so more and more people started coming to the clinic. And over the last 10 years, I would say 90% of the people that I deal with, it's not about allergies anymore. The Lyme people want to get better. The Lyme people want to get better. Absolutely. And um, they, they are seeking. And so they came. So what are some of the other conditions that you commonly work with where advanced cell training has been helpful? And then how much overlap is there with Lyme, chronic fatigue, fibromyalgia, MS? From your perspective, do you see more similarities or more differences with those conditions as compared to Lyme disease? There are similarities in that many other conditions such as my own ankylosing spondylitis which is more about you know joints and your nervous system that it's caused by pathogen okay so Lyme disease has a very specific group of 
and broad range of pathogen, which must be, must be addressed. Ankylosing, for example, has a much narrower bandwidth of pathogen. I think probably because tick bellies collect viruses, parasites, worms, and Bartonella, I think, mutates with everything. That's what I've come to notice. It's The doctors have isolated certain mutations for Bartonella, but I think there are far more than we know, at least I'm see, that's what I'm seeing happen. Uh, so that's one commonality. The other thing that's amazing about Lyme disease to me is I can get someone with a stomach disorder, let's say, strictly from an emotional issue. If people had bad parents, maybe they stored their emotions and, and stress in their stomachs, and so they get IBS or digestive issues. Uh, of course, they can fix that by getting having the body respond properly to PTSD, shock, betrayal, those kinds of things. And they can actually get the acids out that contaminate the stomach. What's been fascinating to me about Lyme, Scott, is that Lyme seems to exacerbate all pre-existing conditions. So if you were that person who had bad parents and you had minor stomach issues prior to Lyme, chances are when you were bit by that tick and afterwards, your stomach condition, your IBS or whatever it was, all of a sudden escalated tremendously. And that's true for all pre-existing conditions. So if you had a minor problem with mold prior to Lyme, chances are you now have a major problem with mold, now that you've had Lyme. And uh, Lyme is, it incorporates, it can, the, the symptoms are so bad. What does Lyme not affect? Right. The nervous system, the stomach, the musculature, the ability to think, the ability to sleep, everything. You can have any one of those symptoms prior to Lyme or a, a combination of them. So all that I've learned from allergies, people develop allergies after Lyme, getting rid of emotions, gets worse after Lyme, killing the pathogen, it's all interconnected. It's the same thing. It's just that Lyme is the most amazing thing I've ever seen. It affects the totality of the individual. Absolutely agree. So this next question is going to be a little bit long, but let's see if I can get it out here. So let's talk a little about the fundamental premise of advanced cell training, how ACT works. Is it that illness is a bad habit of the brain, essentially, and that through the work with ACT, we can get the brain and the body to better identify and respond to these microbial stressors that maybe it isn't responding to or even seeing before, and at the same time, that we then can use ACT to stop over-responding to things like foods and molds and pollens? I mean, is that essentially what we're doing with ACT? Yes, yes. The fundamental concept is that the body can heal itself of pretty much anything, providing it behaves properly as the entire collection of cells. So when you say the brain, yes, the brain has its gifts, but it's a collection of cells as well as the body is. Uh, and so the entirety of the body is comprised of cells which behave. And uh, I'm primarily concerned with the immune system behavior because it's supposed to be killing these pathogens, you know. Um, so, to, so, so where I go is if you have a symptom then, what is your body doing wrong? If you have pathogen, the doctors have tried the antibiotics, they've tried products, they've helped you, they helped me, uh, but it never really delivered me. What I'm going to focus on is, can you train your body's own immune system to do the job? And there's nothing I'm, I'm convinced at this point that the body cannot kill and no place in the body that is inaccessible by itself. So where antibiotics, for example, are good for bacteria only and not viruses and not parasites and not worms and not candida and all of these other things, the body is able to kill all of them. And uh, so it goes, I'm appreciative for antibiotics and great products and Rife machines and all of these things, 
but the body is able to kill everything. And once you train it to recognize and perform properly, a principle then gets kicked in. And that principle is that when you train your body, the cells of your body, it's the same thing, to type, you never forget how to type. When you train your immune system to kill pathogen, it never forgets how to do that. And it is much more thorough than these outside-in remedies. So I like to say that uh, for pathogen and everything else that you train your body to respond properly to, uh, you keep that forever because once you train the body, it remembers it. Now that's pathogen. It also applies to allergies. You know, stop overreacting to foods and chemicals and you know, if it's an allergy mold situation, you can stop that and the body will remember. It also applies to autoimmune, where many of the folks with Lyme will be told your body's attacking itself. That's a bad behavior. So I appreciate the drugs. I appreciate the steroids. I appreciate the, you know, the drugs that take care of emotional highs and lows. They'll save your life. But what we're looking for here is freedom. And if the body is able to heal itself through a behavioral modification program, you are able then to get your body to do what all these wonderful products and procedures are doing from the outside in, from the inside out. And then you make it permanent, and then you become free. And what I like to say is since I taught my body how to kill those pathogen and taught my body how to do proper regeneration of all of my joints, I have not had to go back to Mexico for booster supplementary treatments because my body has done it from the inside out. I mean, I wonder if we can think of antibiotics and antimicrobial herbs and all of those things somewhat uh, similar to dialysis and your system somewhat to getting the kidneys to do what they should be able to do by design. Is that a, a reasonable? I love it. It's the first time I've heard it, it's true. <laughs> okay. <laughs> You know, and you know what I love about that is the outside in things and dialysis will save your life and give yeah. you functionality. But if your kidneys do it on its own, now you have freedom and you don't need to have the outside in support. That is really a wonderful example, Scott. So when you talk about the body maybe not recognizing or responding to microbes and using ACT to kind of engage that neuroimmune system, does the opposite also happen? Meaning that Dr. Klinghart, for example, who's been one of my mentors for many years, will talk about the fact that many of the symptoms we experience are an overreaction of the immune system to specific microbes that is essentially hyperactive or autoimmune-like, and that we need to do something to create integration or tolerance within our microbiome. So does that also happen? Can the immune system be maybe not just not seeing something, but also seeing it and reacting too strongly? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, allergy is an inappropriate overreaction. And I don't know what that re re overreaction looks like. Maybe the body is, and Dr. Klinkhart would have a better discernment for this perhaps, but perhaps it's reacting to the dead waste of a, of a, of a or some part of a, path a pathogen and not approaching it properly. Uh, where I don't have this discernment, and maybe Dr. Klinghart does and does not, I believe the body has perfect discernment for the correct behavior for wherever the incorrect behavior is. So, for example, if I identify a, 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 mic, a microbe, Bartonella, let's say that the misbehavior is that it's not killing it, uh, the body then will recognize the Bar Bartonella and then kill it properly. Let's say that the body is overreacting to something the Bartonella produces. For example, I've had folks who are allergic, not allergic to dogs, but dog saliva. Now, we don't know what kind of residue or other aspects there are to Bartonella. Uh, if the body's overreacting to that and creating symptoms, the body knows if you focus on Bartonella, would correct those overreactions that are inappropriate that Dr. Klinghardt is talking about. Um, where does this information come from? I personally believe it comes from the DNA. I think that uh, if you can put two cells in a test tube and can create a human being, there's some awesome information 
in the DNA. I believe that DNA is the plumb line for correct behavior and encompasses all the my, microbials, the ones that are helpful, the ones that are not helpful. The correct way to perform is already in the DNA. I do not know the right way for the body to perform. All I have to do is identify the substance to which the misbehavior is occurring. I find the body corrects itself with this process. So then when someone goes through ACT, do we think that helps the body then to eliminate these organisms or is it creating a more harmonious relationship or an interplay between our body, our immune system, and our microbiome? Do we actually eradicate these bugs or do we not even need to because our immune system knows how to run the show at that point? I think you're spot on. In fact, I was uh, when it comes to the microbiome, which is sort of a new, a new thing kind of on the scientific plate, if you will, uh, they're not really sure which microbes are good and which microbes are bad and, you know, how it all happens that it, they hit the baby through the mother's womb and then it teaches the body which one's the bad. I mean, there's all these theories, and they say there are theories. And what's wonderful about the body's intelligence, if you ask the right questions to the muscle test, is what the scientists will discover to be true in the future, the body knows already. I will say to you, in clinical experience, I've maybe done thousands of people with, with Lyme disease, and uh, it's only been recently that I've become aware of the microbiome and its positive role. Um, I haven't had to have that knowledge. All I've had to do is point out the microorganisms, and the body would correct its behavior, and that balance would be achieved. Even something like SIBO, where you where your internal... Small uh, intestinal bacterial overgrowth, right? Yes. Yes, that seems to correct when you kill the bad. I'm not really sure what the body... I'm sure the body is letting the good uh, balance occur because that's what it knows it needs. Right. Yeah, it's interesting. I did a podcast recently with Dr. Zach Bush, and he, he, his position is essentially that there aren't any bad pathogens, um, that they all serve a role, and it, that we essentially need to uh, have this tolerance or integration. And I think even Dr. Klinghart's kind of shifting in that direction, that it's not so much about killing or eradicating everything, because we're probably not going to be successful in doing that. In, in the realm of Lyme, you already talked about the fact that there are so many different issues that you can potentially approach with ACT. So it could be Lyme, it could be co-infections, it could be viruses, it could be candida, it could be parasites. I mean, all of these things the immune system can appropriately react to. So my question is, are there particular Lyme-related issues that you find need more attention or focus or maybe phrased another way, is there a particular Lyme-related issue that takes the most codes to teach the body how to respond? Wow. <laughs> Scott, I've got 5,000 pages of codes, <laughs> and most of them came from Lyme people. <laughs> um, when approaching Lyme disease, when I get a new client, Lyme client, the first thing I'm going to look at is their health forms. I would say that 95% of the, of the clients that I get anyway have how childhood abuse, lovelessness from one parent or another as a foundation. Um, so that's got to be addressed. And I will tell you, straightening out the human heart in terms of the long-term effects of very difficult betrayals, I've come to believe as the real foundation for most illness, and, and as, including Lyme. And in fact, people have asked me, well, if my body's health is dependent on my cellular behavior, why did my cells start to misbehave, to over or underreact in the first place? I've come to believe it's the shock of betrayal that somehow shocks the behavioral operating program of the body. So that's a very important thing. And I would say to you that I have many, many clients who, after working with me for three to six months, will go back to their excellent naturopaths, their excellent doctors, chiropractors, machines that will measure the amount of pathogen in their body. And they'll say, your pathogen load is tremendously reduced. 
And I find that they will stay the longest because once they discover that they can leave their past behind in terms of the heartache, the anxiety, the stress, the betrayal, uh, the depression, and come to a place of peace and life that helps relationship, hands down. Now, I do have bunches of people, they kill the, the pathogen, their, their symptoms go down, they're happy and they're gone. But in terms of what has been the most difficult part has been getting the human heart ironed out after it's been broken uh, and traumatized. So I absolutely agree that the emotional piece is often the kind of foundation or maybe sets the stage for these types of conditions. Um, focusing this in just a little bit, if we look at Borrelia, Bartonella, and Babesia, from your experience, do you find that any one of those creates more challenges or requires more code-related work to help the body do the right thing? Without a shadow of a doubt, Bartonella is the bane of Lyme disease from Lyme disease from my perspective. And again, I come to believe that it will mutate with anything. <laughs> you know, that's the assumption I take. Um, when I'm working on the training, I'm looking at Bartonella. What are its mutations? And uh, when I said to you that I have 5,000 pages of codes, so many of those have to do with uh, what Bartonella does. Let me put it this way. I get folks with Lyme disease who have chronic illness and people who don't. They are in two different camps. Um, when I'm dealing with someone who does not have Lyme disease, and I don't have to worry about how Bartonella mutates throughout the body. If they want to take a break, I say, fine, you take a break. But if I have someone with Lyme disease, I will beg them not to go. And if they have to go, I, we have to deal with biofilms before they go. Because what Bartonella will do is it will hide in these places like a biofilm where the Immune system cannot approach them because it's protective and wait for other things to swim by. And if something goes into what I call that storm shelter, no matter what you throw it at a biofilm, uh, that Bartonella, I believe, has a much better chance of existing there and then you mutate. So I will ask them, please, you know, do not leave the class until you address the biofilms. And the thing that, so Bartonella, absolutely. The thing that I'm really pleased to report is that I believe the body is able to dismantle and remove the toxins and the constructs that comprise biofilms. And the reason that I say that is that when folks graduate from my classes, they are, they are training classes. You are, we are showing you how to train your immune system. You train your own immune system. And when there's no more training to do, we call it graduation. And, um, I have folks who will come back to me after eight or 10 or five years, and they've been totally free, not doing anything else, and the, and the disease has not come back. However, in the early, early classes when I first started 15 years ago, and I didn't know about biofilms, some of these people have come back, and I realized that the reason they've been populated is primarily because of Bartonella and its ability to mutate. So Bartonella is an awesome pathogen, and it demands a lot of respect and a lot of attention and a lot of killing. Awesome is one way to <laughs> characterize it. No. <laughs> so, yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. I, I mean, because I do the work on this end, it's overwhelming, yep. you know, the, the, to watch what this pathogen can do it's a force of nature, like a, like a tidal wave. It's awesome. And, um, but I'm just thrilled the body, if it behaves properly, can handle it if, if you train it properly. So let's jump in now to kind of an overview of how ACT works. What's the process someone goes through? What are the codes? How are they identified? And what is the experience of going through one of these classes that you refer to? Okay. Um, the mechanics of the class are pretty easy. Uh, we meet once a week and we, you know, you got a bunch of folks mostly have Lyme there, or various assorted symptoms, many have overlaps. And we discuss the strategy and the training that was done prior and the results. You know, do they Herxheimer, 
Sometimes they do. Do the numbers go down? Because each week, it's very much a result-driven process. They will send me in their health intake forms uh, their, their journey from the parents to what the doctors have said, and then they give me a list of um, their symptoms. And so they'll give me 10 symptoms listed and rate them on a scale of 1 to 10. And every week we are in touch, every week, and they will do their training at home, and they will report on the Herxheimer if there is one, which gives me a clue that maybe you have more work to do. Maybe Bartonella has done something different that I've got to watch depending on what the Herx is. Is it the toe? Is it the brain? It tells you where the, these creatures are. And then you, you look at um, the improvements. So, so that is the process. We meet once a week on a teleconference class. It doesn't. I've got folks from every country you can imagine. Lyme is everywhere these days and uh, across the country, obviously. And we meet once a week by phone or like we are now on, on a computer. Uh, and we review this information and send out training information every week for them to do at home. And then they report it. So that's pretty much the process there. Uh, what, one of the major things that we have is a way to train the body. And the most important thing, I think, is to be able to, to become aware of what you're over or underreacting to. And with an allergy, it's very easy because people will come in and say, gee, if I eat bread, I get stomach aches. Very linear, very simple. So what we would do to train around something like bread is we'd simply, uh, we have words to type right up for bread. You know, when you read a word, your brain generates the frequency of that which you are reading. Okay, everything has atoms and electrons. Everything, therefore, has its own frequency. So we want to focus on the definition as the body sees it, which its electrical signature is its frequency definition. So I'll write up words, breads, what types of bread, sourdough, <laughs> you know, what happens when it hits the hormones, what happens when it hits the digestive acids, what happens when it hits your liver, all of that is written up. And so we'll also ask you to raise the body's intelligence's awareness is we may ask you to take some bread, put it in a plastic bag, and we have people tap it on their thymus, which is, of course, is an old homeopathic trick. We are trying to raise the body's awareness. In this case, to, bread is the substance which the misbehavior is occurring. If your elbow gets sore, if you break out in a rash, I'm going to ask you while you're tapping the bread, touch where the symptom occurs. Stomach, knee, do you get brain fog? As you're fixating on the codes here, as you read those codes that define how the body sees bread internally. So, so that is a critical, crucial point. That is the role of the codes as a component part. We have the symptom to raise awareness, the substance to raise awareness, and uh, we, we have the codes to raise awareness. All the same objective. If you're going to correct an error, if you're going to correct an error, you need to be aware of where that error is occurring, the substance and the symptom. Now let's take this same principle and apply it to Lyme disease. So what I'll do then now, it's not as obvious because we don't know if it's Bartonella, we don't know if it's co-infection, we don't know if it's Babesia or Ehrlichia or Morgellons or Rickettsia. So someone will come to me with a specific symptom. Ah, we have a symptom to focus on for, the, for your work. I'm gonna muscle test your body and determine which pathogen are appropriate to focus on. Maybe it's Bartonella, maybe it's a virus, maybe it's a parasite, maybe it's a worm. Whatever your body chooses as the chief culprit creating that symptom is what I'm going to send you in writing for you to study to, to focus on for your training efforts. And so the training effort of someone going through and looking at these codes for people that aren't familiar and, and maybe interested, how much time over that next week do they need to invest in reading codes and training? Great question. The reading of the codes 
should not be more than a seven minute process. We're just reading words that define the pathogen. So that's seven minutes. Now, what we also employ is, is music. It's a Pavlovian kind of thing, which the intelligence of the cell is different than the intelligence of the mind. If, you're one of, if you want to learn about a subject, you will read and spend time there. Uh, we want to keep the body focused on its error so that it can learn to shift behavior. If you've been ill for 25 and 30 years like I was, my misbehavior was an underreaction toward those pathogen for 25 years. If you've had Lyme for years or decades, that body is in a behavior that is incorrect for a long time. It's become a habit. So Pavlo demonstrated that you can associate behavioral change of, the, of a cells with music. So after you read your codes, you will then listen to music for an hour. And it can be in the background, you can work, you can drive your car, you can shop, you can talk on the phone. It's for your body to remain focused on the error. Um, so the reading of the codes is seven minutes. You've got to listen to music in the background. You can do anything else for an hour. And then the next step is you call in to get set. Uh, what happens is we have learned that people are spiritual beings as well. Uh, Einstein said that matter is energy, it's invisible. Part of us is invisible. We are energy. Matter is energy. And uh, so we will have a quiet, silent prayer that we use. There are double-blind studies which prove they are effective. There are also those that say it's, you know, hogwash. We find it works. In fact, it fixed so many things in the old days before I used it um, that it's a no-brainer for me. And so they call in for a five-second silent prayer, and then sometime in the next day they have to listen to that music again. And somewhere in there, the body shifts from misbehavior to corrective behavior, from overreaction and underreaction to proper response. Then sometimes there's a Herxheimer, which I'm going to ask them to record and send to me in the weekly email. And I'm going to ask them to record if there's any symptom reductions as a result of less information because of pathogen that have died or the body is no longer attacking itself or the body is no longer attacking wheat. And, and are they then reading the codes and listening to the music every day during that week or just the one time? The one time. So, okay. yeah. so it's not a huge time investment for people that are listening then. Okay. It's a you know, very gracious, accommodating process. So is ACT, can we think of it then as training our body to be its own internal rife machine? Are these codes or instructions essentially frequencies that are telling the body what to do very similar to what a rife machine might do? Yes, yes, okay. yes. Good. <laughs> That's a good one. Okay. So talking a little about the Herxheimer reaction, you just mentioned there is a potential for that. Do you find though that when the body is controlling the correct behavior that the Herxheimer reactions are, are more manageable than something else that you might take or do from outside where there is really no control in terms of the amount other than, you know, what you're taking or what you're getting exposed to? Is the body a little more intelligent or can the Herxheimer reaction still be quite significant? The vast majority of the time, the Herxheimers are made tolerable because the body's own intelligence, as you're inferring, Scott, will look at the populations, I believe, of the pathogen, calculate the amount of toxin, take a look at the ability of the lymphatic system and the potency of the toxin, and it may choose, the body's own wisdom may choose to kill 100% of those pathogen in an hour, and they'll get the call, oh my gosh, my symptom just went that day. Or it may choose, because of its toxic removal limitations, to kill 10% a day and people will have a mild extended Herx, and then they'll say, you know, the symptom has reduced. So uh, I do have a few exceptions to that. In fact, one lady on the internet uh, had some kind of other condition that I hadn't seen before, and every time she did a code, uh, she had a tremendous Herx, and because of it, she stuck with it, but her Herxes were too much, 
at least on the internet, she was honest and said it was working for other people. There's something to it. I just couldn't stand the herks. I maybe have had that happen three times in 20 years. So toxicity is a big discussion point in these chronic illnesses as well. So the terrain is essentially important to consider um, when we have these overgrowths of pathogens. Some people suggest that that's related to a toxic terrain, to our environment becoming more toxic. How does the ACT work help the body to better detoxify and improve ultimately our terrain? There are so many scenarios that it's a very, very good question. <laughs> okay, let's begin with toxic buildup that occurs prior to the contraction of, say, a disease like Lyme disease. Um, I had that. I, I, I went in my ankylosing spondylitis. I saw this incredibly wonderful alternative clinic. They determined I had a toxic issue. They gave me DMPS, EDTA. I've done intramuscular ozone, my teeth were glowing white, I did so much of it, and they cleaned my body out. Uh, once I started this process, I then would check on it again, and I had my fillings removed and all of that, things that people commonly do, and my toxic levels had gone back out, back up, despite my good eating habits, the, the fresh water, the taking of these cleansing things. You know what I discovered? My cells were collecting toxins from the atmosphere. So a car would drive by and a properly performing body would get rid of that. My body was confused and storing it. So the toxic issue is in part, uh, what is your body doing before you get sick? Now, once you get sick, that can cause the body to misfire. I had a person the other day who's become what's called a universal reactor because of Lyme. Her body sees everything as a threat. She develops an EMF allergy in seconds. She says, I've got to change my computer. Mm -hmm. I've, I've got to buy clothes that I can return in three days because my body will start to fight them. Mm -hmm. When you get Lyme disease or a major chronic illness, the shock alone of that disease can create the dysfunction. Then, of course, there's the so are your cells getting rid of the toxins as a habit before and after. Once you do contract a pathogenic disease, and as these pathogens die, if the body isn't 100% getting, getting it out of the body, then you've got to call in other things. And I often will recommend, based on the body's approval, things like ion cleanse machine, infrared sauna. I love it when people have smart, capable professionals who know how to do detox safely, um, and we all work together once there's a tremendous buildup. But to maintain that, again, the reason that I don't need to do any more chelation uh, is because my body now gets, now I don't have any pathogen that are, you know, but my, but my body is now removing toxin as a normal daily behavior instead of ignoring it and letting it stockpile. So the accumulation of toxicity is the result of this recognition problem as well that ACT can also help to teach the body to more correctly recognize and respond to the toxins so that you don't have this buildup over time, correct? Yes, that's exactly right. And Perfect. to put it back into the principle, if you had a pre-existing condition where your body was storing toxins, once you get Lyme, it's gonna get way worse because the pathogen will create a lot more toxins. Right. Uh, the other thing that I would say on that note is I find often, and I watch for this in the symptom reporting, is that sometimes the pathogen will attack the channels that would eliminate waste in the lymphatic system. If those channels become swollen, now you don't have any flow, like a garden hose that sw swells. So um, I watch for that very early on because sometimes that's the only problem. The body is getting rid of toxin, but it can't because the pathogen uh, are inflaming the lymphatic system. So we'll target those for training, and often they'll have an extended Herxheimer because, you know, there's a lot of garbage to get rid of, and then they start to do very well. So that's another aspect of detox uh, for your records. So you mentioned this earlier, but a significant portion of the Lyme disease population is also dealing with mold illness from living in or working in a water damaged building. 
And in the realm of mold illness, there's kind of these two different paths. There's the allergy path or the overreactive response to the mold or mold toxins. And then there's also the biotoxin pathway, which is a little different, the chronic inflammatory response syndrome pathway. And so where does ACT fit in? Is it fitting in more on the allergy side or is it able to help the body to recognize mold and mold toxins across both the allergy side and this biotoxin illness side of things? Yes, I would say both are true. I, I, again, um, I am amazed by how the medical community, community understands how mold can affect a, a person I know it can be allergic because I had a mold allergy. And, but I also know that if the body allows certain kinds of mold to live within it, not only will the mold attack the organs, but also the toxins that leave become a problem. And you also mentioned the third issue, which is the neurological system, which can somehow it's totally almost going into shock because of mold. There's fear and there is shock as well with mold. It's a very uh, interesting phenomenon. Um, but again, the body does know how to respond to each of these components. I don't know how, I, I'm not going to tell a person how to respond, but the body's DNA, I believe, does have the correct response to each component of this. And I'm seeing people get better from the trauma, the fear of mold, uh, what the mold actually does on a toxic level, the allergy, and how mold can indeed uh, attack the cells of your of your body. Let's come back to the conversation about EMFs. So you talked about people that have pathogens like Lyme potentially become these universal reactors. They uh, potentially react to electromagnetic fields. So when these pathogens potentially trigger this environmental sensitivity, um, do we then have a way with ACT to address their reactivity to EMFs, for example? Is it that working on the pathogens over time helps to reduce that sensitivity, or is there something specific in ACT to teach the body how to react to these fields that we're basically enveloped in all the time? If it's, if it's just an allergy, some people have EMF allergies prior to getting Lyme, Again, the body defines everything as a frequency. So EMF is a pure frequency, which has its own definition. And if the body is overreacting to that, then it can stop. I've had people have difficulty with the full moon, which is a major blast of EMF or their computers or their cell phones kind of thing. If it was just allergy, that's pretty easy. Stop overreacting to, aller to, to the EMF and you'll be fine. Um, however, when it comes to Lyme disease, there's often been more to it. Uh, I believe that when a, some people, when they are bit by a Lyme tick, the body almost knows what's coming and it goes into a form of a shock. If that shock goes into the neurological sim system, you will then have an overreactive uh, neurological system. It's, I liken it to hypothermia. You know, if someone is coming out of the ice and you ask them what time it is, uh, they can't tell you because they're just in raw shock. What we'll do is if the muscle test affirms that's the case, we will work on the body to remove the shock out of the neuro neurological system. Once you do that, then you can work with it to train it how to not overreact to EMS. So um, when Lyme has done that to the neurological system, sometimes it's damage. You know, uh, if the neurological system, let's say it wasn't the shock of the initial bite because the body knew it was coming, Let's just say that, that the pathogen were attacking the myelin sheath and you've got spots on your brain on MRIs. What we may have to do is focus on those pathogen first so that they stop attacking the myelin sheath. The myelin sheath will regenerate, regenerate it's a collagen tissue, and then you can deal with the EMF. Beautiful. Another very common issue um, more and more over the past few years is mast cell activation syndrome or disorder and histamine intolerance. And it seems like many, many people with Lyme also experience this mast cell activation. Many people with mold experience it as well. Do you find that by teaching the body how to respond more appropriately, both in terms of responding appropriately to pathogens, but also to stop overreacting to all of these 
allergens, do you find that mast cell activation symptoms and histamine intolerance symptoms, do those tend to resolve or lessen when people are doing ACT? The clients mentioned that. And, uh, you know, this has been recent talk in the last 10 years where I'm hearing more and more of this. Over the last, and of course, I, I can't know about all of this in depth and in detail. What I do observe, though, is those concerns go away uh, as they train their body to kill the pathogen and all the things we're talking about. Mm -hmm. uh, so I believe it is overcomable. I think the scientists are doing a great job seeing what's happening mechanically in the body. But I think that these things often happen after the pathogen have attacked everything in the human body. And when yeah. you kill the uh, pathogen a lot changes combined with one other thing and that's the uh, epigeneticists where many medical scientists are saying if you have this gene issue you're kind of in a corner here there's not much you can do there's another group of scientists who are epigeneticists saying that you can change there are switches on these genes and your environment can change what the genes do and don't do uh, because I am seeing people with this information from their doctors from tests get well, I tend to side with the epigeneticists. Yeah, I and, do as well, for sure. Yeah. So, so I'm, you know, most of what I know has been clinically driven by the muscle test and observation, and I'm seeing these folks get well. Not everybody gets well, but I'm seeing a, a, a lot of people who are being told these things indeed are overcoming their illnesses. It's been suggested that about 6% of people with Lyme disease also struggle with Morgellons. And I've heard you talk about Morgellons in the past related to ACT. So how does AT, ACT potentially support people dealing with Morgellons? Do we know from your work what Morgellons is actually caused by? Or is that not necessarily something we need to know in order to direct the body to respond more appropriately? That's exactly right. I mean, there's so much talk about, you know, Morgellons is a part of Lyme disease. At, at least I see many who have Lyme. I guess it comes in through a tick or an insight fight. And in the Lyme community itself, they're talking about, well, where do these pathogens come from? Is it in utero contraction, which is possible? Mosquito, I'm sure you get a batch of pathogen from the mosquito as they always can give you encephalitis. Ticks, yes. Fleas, that's an arachnid too, just like a tick. So there are many, you know, kissing someone, I don't know. Once you're sick, the goal is to kill the pathogen of secondary importance or even less is where did they come from? I mean, it's great to avoid ticks, but once they're in you, um, you want to get your internal environment pathogen free. If you were healthy prior to contracting Morgellons or Bartonella, it's because it wasn't there affecting your body. If you could get your body back to that place where those pathogen are not there, you should have the same health that you had before you were bit by that tick or that insect or more gallons, gallons, however it's the, the other very common thing that I see a lot of people asking about, I get lots of emails about, is this fairly newer idea of rope worms. And uh, some people think of rope worms as parasites. Some people think of them as a biofilm community. Some people think of them as a way the body is detoxifying. Um, is there something in ACT that can help the body respond to rope worms? And what are your thoughts on this thing, whatever it actually might be? Worms are an interesting topic because I don't think anyone wants to believe something that big could inhabit the human body. It's very unsettling, disconcerting. Uh, my answer is, yes, I have codes for rope worms, mm -hmm. for uh, strongaloides. There are, I got probably 200 pages of worms that you can train for. What I would say to you is, uh, I had one woman who was riddled with worms, and the reason she knew that is she was getting colonics three times a week, and in the outflow in the latex tube, she's seeing two, five, ten inch worms, and she is horrified. She looked like a zombie, sleeping 20 hours a day. Her skin was pallid. Her eyes were red. 
And uh, so I worked with her for 20 different trainings on maybe 75 to 100 different kinds of worms. And uh, at the end of that, it was about a three-month project. Her skin color came back, and she was working with her husband and working 10 hours a day kind of thing, sleeping normally, living normally. Skin cleared up, eyes cleared up. But she con- so she stopped seeing me, <laughs> and she continued to do colonics every week for, for four to five months. How do I know this? After four to five months, she came back to me to let me know she hadn't seen a worm, so we did the job. Wow. I think anybody who saw those worms leave their body would continue to check. Uh, so I know that if you have evidence of worms, some people see things in their stool um, that clearly are a parasite or a worm or a fluke, yes, the body can kill those. One of the challenges with a lot of the things that we can do in the Lyme treatment realm is that we might just be managing the issue for a period of time. And when we stop whatever the treatment is, we get into a stressful situation, some emotional trauma, accident, surgery, whatever, symptoms might then start to reappear. And it sounds like in ACT, once you've re-educated the body in terms of a proper response, that that, that is a longer term uh, piece of information that the body continues to benefit from. Are there cases where the body might forget what it learned from ACT and you have to go back and, and revisit it? Or is it uncommon for someone to have a relapse at some point once the body's been properly educated? So many things can cause symptoms. That's such a good question. Stress alone can cause symptoms. Mm-hmm. I've had folks graduate from Lyme class who's, um, you know, they lost their house or their husband died and they'll have other symptoms and we have to work on the emotions alone. Um, another scenario, I think probably more appropriate to answer your question, when people graduate, they they only come back to me if they catch something new or a bit again by a Lyme tick. They go, I got fixed there last time. Let me go back again. Um, but do they need to come back again if the Lyme tick had pathogens that the body now knew how to respond to? Or does it only happen if they then get exposed to something that their body hadn't previously been re-educated about? Your questions are so good and so accurate, Scott. Yes, they only have to train if there was something new in that tick that we didn't train for and the body doesn't see it. So if they're bit by a different tick and it has all the exact same pathogen from the first tick, I've had people bring their ticks to class and we tap the tick because the, the body can read the pathogen that are in the tick, okay? And they'll need no work. And I'll ask them, do you have any symptoms? And they'll say, no. I say, I guess we're safe, but keep watching. If you get a symptom, maybe we miss something. Uh, But if they get bit by a fresh tick and there is a group, let's say it comes in from Europe, you know, on a bird or something, and there's a block that they didn't have last time, Mm -hmm. if the body recognizes them, they won't need me because the body already kills pathogens. If there's a a percentage that the body doesn't recognize, they will need what I call a tune-up. So yes, once the body learns to kill a particular strain of pathogen, I believe based on the years I've been at it and people coming back to me with ticks, the body is remembering. And and does the body learn how to respond to a particular strain of pathogen with the code only if the person actually has that particular strain of pathogen or can it learn how to respond in the future to something it hasn't yet seen? Where do you get your question, Scott? (laughs) (laughs) That is such a good question. Um, What I like to say is the codes are flexible. The codes are flexible. So I have a class and I have folks from... Rhode Island, California, to Sweden, they're everywhere. Mm -hmm. I'll send out the same page of codes. Remember, they're touching their symptoms. They're looking up Bartonella on the computer screen to educate their bodies what it looks like. 
they're reading words, Bartonella strain one to a thousand. That, that's what a code is. Bartonella strain one to a thousand. That's a thousand different strains. What the body will do since you're engaged in this process is it's going to look at the Bartonella that's in your body. Mm -hmm. And that's why the person in Rhode Island is training his body for the particular tick that bit him and the person in California or Europe, they're training their body because they're raising the awareness of the intruder that is causing, causing the damage in the tissue. So uh, when I say flexible, uh, if a code says, for example, I want a car, Scott, go buy me a red 1974 Mustang with leather interior and it's a convertible, that is not a flexible order. But if I say to you, I need a car, Scott, please go buy me a car, you then can pick any kind of car that you think is right. Yep. That's what the body is doing. We're raising the body's awareness to what's attacking you so that you attack it on the inside. So what is the average duration that someone would go through ACT before they potentially would graduate? And are there some factors that impact how long a specific client might need to continue the program to get longer term results? You know, the answer to that is it depends. What I like to say, if you've had Lyme for less than five years, that's a lot less time for Bartonella to mutate and populate. Um, over five years, you know what, 10, 20 years, that Bartonella has interacted, just assume, with every virus and bacteria that's come into your body from the air, the water, wherever you got it. Um, if your parents were loving to you, you are going to have a systemic strength. If your parents were abusive to you, you're going to be weak from depression and anxiety. That's another factor. So length of time and how well were you loved by your parents. Generally speaking, if you've had it less than five years and you had great parents, you know what? I'll be surprised if you stay longer than six months. If you've had it for five years or more and you've been carrying the weight of the betrayal and trauma, um, you know, it made your body weaker. That's going to, Bartonella is going to mutate more in a weak environment than in a strong one, I believe. And, you know, you might want to figure a year something like that. Um, the people who stay with me the longest are those who have come to appreciate the emotional freedom. And many of them stay just because they see themselves getting healthier, stronger, emotionally and relationally. You know, they go to their families, you know, get togethers and outings once every three years or once a year. And all of a sudden, all the stress is gone because they processed it. And some people really appreciate that. So do we have any insights around how frequently ACT is successful for someone dealing with Lyme disease? Um, you know, I, I get a little antsy about that because uh, the government, um, you've got to be careful with the government, what they perceive as claims. Right. Uh, my only claim is that the body can heal itself. And you know, I've got notarized testimonials and video testimonials and Facebook reviews and Google reviews that support the notion that people can heal themselves on their own. Mm -hmm. um, we, the people who stay improve. <laughs> and if they correct all of their errors, they get free. Uh, Part of that, I, I really have a hard time with the, with the percentage thing sure, yeah. because the government has already been through my office. Uh, specifically, what they did was they, I had a book of notarized testimonials. They assumed they were fraudulent. They went and visited a bunch of those folks who had signed those no, notarized testimonials, um, and the, the people validated them, so they had to drop their case. They found out that the people were telling the truth. And uh, But what I learned through that whole ordeal is you have to be very careful if you're in the alternative medical world, what you say. And percentages are seen as claims, yep. so I tend to avoid that. I will say this, that any person can try our process for four training sessions. And, and so if, that's, that's one month, right? That's one month, a okay. one-month trial. 
And if they are unhappy for any reason, we give them all of their money back. And remember, they're measuring their symptoms every week. So um, people who stay, it's, and the classes are voluntarily attended. It's not like a college class. You've got to stay in there six months. No. Every week that you choose to come to class is because you believe it's worth your $58 session. So you've been doing this work now, evolving it for almost 20 years with thousands of people. Why is it in the Lyme community that we don't seem to hear more about it? I've been aware of it for a long time, obviously, but it's, it's not one that you hear people talk about a lot. Why, why do you think that is? I, I can't answer that. I've always said if people could sit in and hear the clients report their symptoms, uh, reductions, there would be lines around the office from here to Chicago. Um, but I, I don't think there's a centralized distribution center for what works in alternative medicine. In traditional medicine, you've got your doctor who's influenced by the you know, pharmaceutical companies to, and the ads that they put. I could never put those ads on television. I could, you know, the doctors do not talk by and large about alternative medicine. Very, very few of my clients have come from doctor referrals. They've all seen their doctors. The doctors have seen them well, but it is not in the doctor's repertoire to refer out something alternative. In fact, they jeopardize their licenses. Their credibility depends upon staying within the insurance parameters and what is generally accepted as usual and customary treatment. So, but we get all of our information about the new treatments from television, the new pill, and also, you know, your doctor serves as a center. I'll send you this specialist. I'll send you that specialist. And so you're led around. We don't have that in alternative medicine. You've got to discover. It. So um, I don't know. I hear about new therapies every day that are wonderful. And it's by, by hook and by crook. So I, I don't know that I can uh, answer that question. I wonder, I wonder if some of it is that the people, especially on you know, social media groups and so on, the people that are often there still talking about these issues are still searching and looking for solutions. And maybe in this case, if people get to the point that their body's managing everything and then they're doing well and their symptoms are gone, maybe, maybe they're not on social media anymore. Maybe they're back to their life. I, I, I don't know. Yeah, that's, I would agree with that 100%. What I find is people look desperately for answers before they get well. Uh, people get well. And you know what they do? They catch up on all the life they lost. If you've been bed bound for five to 10 years and all of a sudden you can walk again and you don't need a wheelchair anymore like you know some of my clients do, mm -hmm. they don't want to focus on illness anymore. They don't want to focus in chat groups about how they hurt anymore. They want to love their kids. They want to support their families. They want to go back to art and their passions, which is not about being ill. It's about doing life. So right. I think you're right. Yeah, and just for people listening, I mean, Gary is not paying me a penny to do this podcast. I really am uh, just interested in solutions and things that potentially will work for people um, and have known Gary for many years and just wanted to put this information out there. So for people listening, um, I am not being compensated in any way by Gary for putting ACT out there. So um, Gary, let's wrap up with what are some of the key things that you personally do on a daily basis to support your own health? Now that my path, now that my pathogen are gone, my joints are gone, and I can sleep. Uh, there's really only two things that I, three things. I do exercise three times a week. I do eat clean. I'm trying to lose 15 pounds. <laughs> um, but I think what is very smart is I got rid of mucoid plaque. If you know about mucoid plaque, there are certain diets you can do to totally clean your colon. Uh, all the water you drink comes in through your colon, 95% of it. And if you've got that plaque lining your colon, it's a good idea not to have it there. So to keep a maintenance plan on the buildup of plaque in the colon, because we're eating processed foods, is I take um, psyllium seed husk, probably 10 to 15 capsules a day, which continually, you know, give me more roughage than I could ever eat to keep me clean there. And the other thing is they don't, re 
they don't rotate the crops. And so I think there's a mineral deficiency in our vegetables. And even though I'm eating clean, I've got alfalfa root, dulse, kelp, all ground up in little pills that I take to make sure my body gets the nutrient that it needs that is not in the food today when it was there maybe 100 years ago. Those are the only two things that I do. Beautiful. This has been fun. It's been informative. I um, have known you for a number of years, and I think you are a person of high intention. I think that you got into this work because of your own health journey and really just wanting to help people. Um, I don't think there's an aspect of you doing this to try to make money in, in doing this work. And so I just really value and appreciate that there are people like you out there that are looking beyond the traditional box to try and find things that may help people with Lyme disease, with other chronic conditions. I know ACT is not limited to Lyme disease. Um, but I just thank you very much for what you're doing and for taking time today to share with us and just really appreciate you, Gary. Thank you, Scott. Yeah, thank you, Scott. So it's been a pleasure to be here and I very much enjoy it. All right. Thanks so much. Be well. To learn more about today's guest, visit advancedcelltraining.com. That's advancedcelltraining.com. Thanks for your interest in today's show. If you'd like to follow me on Facebook or Twitter, you can find me there as Better Health Guy. To support the show, please visit betterhealthguy.com forward slash donate. If you'd like to be added to my newsletter, visit betterhealthguy.com forward slash newsletters. And this and other shows can be found on YouTube, iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, and Spotify. Thanks for listening to this Better Health Guy blogcast with Scott, your Better Health Guy. To check out additional shows and learn more about Scott's personal journey to better health, please visit BetterHealthGuy.com.